Would you bow your heads with me, please, for an added word of prayer? O oh, our Father in heaven, our hearts are open to receive the love, the wisdom, the discernment, the power, all the blessings of heaven that you long to give us right now. Please meet our needs, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my sermon today is Encouragement for a Troubled Heart. Encouragement for a Troubled Heart. Just this week, as I was preparing the message, I received a phone call from a long distance friend. I don't know if you can relate to what they told me. I don't know if you've experienced what they told me. They said, I have so much anxiety. They said, I don't know where this came from. I've never had a problem with anxiety before. But they said, I can't even go out of the house. If I go five or ten minutes from the house, I'm just overcome with anxiety. And so I'm staying at home. I'm staying at home most days. I just can't even venture out. People all around us are experiencing stress, a troubled heart, anxiety, even depression, and chronic situations. To all of this, what does Jesus say? You know what Jesus says. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Listen to that. Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus said that. When did he say that? He said that on Thursday night, just before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane where he was arrested for his mock trial. This Jesus said after the Lord's Supper, after the disciples had their feet washed by Jesus. In his closing remarks, he had just said, I'm leaving you now, and where I'm going you cannot follow. Oh, that crushed the disciples. They didn't understand what he said. They didn't know what he meant. He was going to some place where they couldn't follow. Not then. He said later they would follow. Where was he going? What was he going to do? Was he going to leave them? The anxiety began to build in them. They were so anxious. They were so discouraged and overwhelmed. And that's when Jesus spoke to the disciples in their anxiety. Let not your heart be troubled. You know, Jesus experienced trouble. He experienced a lot of trouble. Everywhere he went, people followed him to dog his footsteps, to challenge him at every turn, to challenge what he was doing, what he was teaching, what he believed. Even who he was was challenged. And yet, Jesus could say, let not your heart be troubled. Jesus' heart wasn't troubled, even with all that was going on around him. He remained calm and unshaken. The disciples knew and experienced trouble. They had had trouble ever since they began their discipleship under Jesus. They had pressure and anxiety and stress and trouble of many kinds. So Jesus experienced trouble. The disciples experienced trouble. What about the early church? Oh, we just learned this morning in our study that it was during the lifetime of the first Christians that the Christian church began to rip and tear apart. 
into splintered schisms. Yes, in addition to Jesus and the disciples having trouble all around them, the early Christian church was embedded in trouble. Trouble was all around it and them. Even the persecution, the uh, martyrs who died for their faith, they all experienced, they knew firsthand what trouble was. What about the world today? Oh, our world today is smothered in trouble. Everywhere we turn, there's trouble of some sort. Every day you listen to the news and there's some new trouble or trouble in some new place, some new kind of trouble arising. Trouble is our nearest companion in this world. Well, what about the church? Our church, the Christian church, isn't it a safe place, safe from trouble? No, it isn't. Even in the church, there is trouble. Everywhere we turn, there is trouble. So how could Jesus say, let not your heart be troubled? How could he say that to the disciples? Was that false hope? Was that a false claim? Let's turn to John 14, a passage that you're very familiar with, John chapter 14. And we're going to see much more in this passage than just the opening five or six words. Jesus in six words says, let not your heart be troubled, but there's more. There's more that follows. John chapter 14 starts with, let not your heart be troubled. But then John gives six reasons why our hearts don't need to be troubled. Six, six promises to help us overcome the troubled environment that we live in. Listen to this. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. There's number one. We have a God that we can believe in. We have Jesus, a Savior, that we can believe in. We can put our full belief in Jesus. Don't ever forget when trouble arises again in your life or in the church, in the community, in the world, when trouble strikes, remember, you believe in God. You believe in Jesus. And that's enough. Look at the next phrase, verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. That's another reason why we don't need to be troubled. Our homes here are just temporary. We have a home in heaven, a mansion in heaven. Imagine that. So not only do we have a God that we can believe in and a Jesus, a Savior that we can believe in, but they have built us mansions. No wonder our hearts can be untroubled with the thought of where we are going and what is waiting for us. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus is saying, I'm going to keep you informed. I'm not going to let anything surprise you. You're not going to go through any major event in this world that I haven't already forewarned you about. Jesus is saying, I've taken great care to be sure that you know what's coming. You know the details as far as you need to know them of what's ahead. Isn't that wonderful? And so not only has God given us a belief, a belief in him and his son Jesus, not only has he built us mansions, but... He has 
told us everything we need to know to be secure and at peace, untroubled, troubled free. Look at verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Oh, that's the heart of the promise. That's where the name of our church comes from, the second coming, Adventists. Adventists, we believe in the Advent, the second Advent, that he is coming again. And Jesus gives this as one of the promises that we can hang hope on, not our trouble, but our hope. We can trust that our hope in Jesus is secure because he says, I will come again. But here, the best is saved for last. I love this closing phrase. This is the key point in the message today. Did you get that? If you're taking notes, if you want to remember what the sermon is about beyond Wednesday, I'm giving you a clue. It's about this next point. And will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus is going to receive us to himself. He will take us to be with him. He will accept us, and we will be glorified and moved to heaven. Why? Because where he is, he wants us to be. Isn't that amazing? Can you even get your mind around that, that we have a God who is so amazing in his love that wherever he is, he wants us to be. Where he is in heaven, he wants us to be with him in heaven. That is powerful. And heaven? Heaven is truly trouble-free. Heaven has never known trouble. There was one point in history, before the history of planet Earth, when there was trouble in heaven. But no more. Heaven is a place of peace. The trouble was cast out. And so we see six promises. Six promises that we can put assurance and confidence in that when trouble arises, when we begin to feel troubled, these six promises can give us the hope to overcome. We believe in God. He is building us mansions. He would have told you if it weren't so. He's told us all we need to know. And he will come again, and he will receive us to himself, because where he is, he wants us to be. The greatest antidote, the greatest antidote for a troubled heart is the promises of Jesus, especially the promise that where he is, he wants you and me to be also. I'd like for you to next turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's look at a passage here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we'll start with verse 8. And it says, We are troubled on every side. This is Paul writing, the great apostle of hope, the great apostle of faith. And what does he say? We are troubled on every side. Listen as he goes on. Yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always 
bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in your body. Well, I want to reread this. I want to read it from the Living Translation because it echoes, it repeats the message at the end of our John passage, where in John it said that Jesus wants us to be where he is. He wants to have an intimate relationship with him. That's repeated right here. Let me read it in the Living Version, starting with verse 8. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but not crushed and not broken. We are perplexed because we don't know why things happen as they do, but we don't give up or quit. We are haunted down. We are hunted down, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up again and keep going. These bodies of ours are constantly facing death just as Jesus did. So it is clear to all that it is only the living Christ within us who keeps us safe. Did you catch that? Again, a phrase about the intimate relationship Jesus wants to have with us. Christianity is about a relationship with God. And the way to overcome the troubles of the last days is to be in an intimate relationship with God. I just love that last line. It is only the living Christ within who keeps us safe. Yes, we have Christ living in us. It is not I, but Christ who lives, who lives in me. What a powerful concept. It's actually, in a theological sense, an incarnation of Christ. Christ was incarnated into the human family through Mary. But Christ is incarnated into the human family when he enters your life and my life. It's a type of incarnation. Christ in man. Christ in you and me. And that, that is what gives us hope in the face of trouble. That's what gives us trust and peace in the face of trouble. Christ in us. Well, I'd like to have us look at Luke chapter 10 next. Let's turn to Luke chapter 10. And another powerful passage, I believe, that will be a blessing to us today. By the way, this passage, Luke 10, has the same concept, Christ in us. God longing to be with us. Listen to this. It's Luke chapter 10, verses 41 and 42. Jesus had just arrived at Lazarus' house. It was his first visit to Lazarus' house. He was a guest for the night. And Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha. Mary... Mary was very relationship-oriented. Martha was very project-oriented. Martha fixed the house because Jesus was coming. Martha was concerned about the food and the meal that would be served. But Mary, all she could think of was seeing Jesus and being with Jesus. She wanted to sit at his feet and listen to him. And listen, listen to what it says. Verse 41, Luke 10. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. You see, Martha had just entered the room and she said, Jesus, 
Can't you see my sister Mary is not doing anything to help? Uh, can't you have a word with her and encourage her to help me prepare the meal? Of course, Jesus would do that, wouldn't he? He was hungry. He wanted a good meal. He'd send the ladies to the kitchen to work together. No, that's not what he did. Look at verse 41. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. One thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. You want to know something amazing that I learned about this passage that I didn't know? I studied Greek for three years, but we never covered this phrase. In verse, 40, verse 42, where it says, which shall not be taken away from her, that pronoun which can be translated or used in Greek as what, it can be which, or what, or who. Really? Then listen to it with the who inserted. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, who shall not be taken away from her. Jesus was talking about himself here. Mary has chosen me, Jesus said, and I won't be taken away from her. And Mary understood. She just stayed on the footstool in front of Jesus, listening to Jesus. I ran across a quotation in the um, book, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 358. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 358. It says this, that Mary, sitting on that stool at his feet, was charmed by Jesus' words. Jesus, Mary was charmed by Jesus' words. I'm not sure what she meant by that word charmed. But I know this, she must have been drawn to Jesus' words, attracted to Jesus' words. There was, there was an energy in Jesus' words. There was something powerful about Jesus' words. And she wanted to stay right there and hear more. The question for us today is, are we charmed by the words of Jesus? I want to be charmed by Jesus' words every day. I don't know about you. I want to feel an energy when I'm with Jesus in his word. When I'm reading the Bible, I want to feel charmed by Jesus' words drawn to him, compelled to him. It says in verse 42, But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part. What? What was the one part needful? What was the one part that Mary had chosen that was so needful? One writer put it this way, what was so needful was a calm, devotional spirit. I love that. Let your mind wrap around that. A calm, devotional spirit. Devotional, you're devoted to Jesus. Devotional, your time with Jesus. Devotional, your thoughts that you give to Jesus. That calm, 
devotional experience with Jesus through the Spirit. Wow, that is the one needful thing which Mary had chosen. Let's go to one more text, shall we? This time in Psalms. Let's go to Psalms chapter 27. And we will see again the same thread. The thread that we've seen through all the passages this morning. Each passage had that same consistent thread of an intimate relationship with Jesus. A, a Savior that wants to be with us and wants us to be with him. A, a, a relationship uh, that will never be separated. No matter what troubles come, no trouble can separate us from Jesus. Now look at Psalms 27, and I'll read verse 4. Um, actually, I'll start with verse 3. Psalms 27, verse 3. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Do you get the message this morning? Did you get the message? In passage after passage, the cure for our troubled world is our intimate relationship with Jesus. He longs to have that intimate relationship with you and me. He longs to be with you and me and to have us with him. He longs to have us Behold the beauty of the Lord and to dwell in the house of the Lord. He longs to have that deep relationship with him. So why is it that this common thread is the answer for our troubled world? Because there is no trouble in the universe that can separate Jesus from you and from me. Amen. Amen. O oh God in heaven, thank you for reminding us of such a simple truth, but we need it so much in our troubled world today. Thank you for reminding us that no trouble will separate you from us, and that you love us so much that our troubles can vanish and disappear because of the knowledge that you want to be with us and will be with us soon, and we will never be separated. What an awesome God you are. Thank you for this message of calm, trust, and assurance. In Jesus' name, amen.